so first of all, I would like to thank uh, Angela, Miles, and Monica for the uh, invitation. It's a, a, a great honor to speak in this uh, uh, very nice uh, webinar that was one of the first uh, webinars to be put online. Uh, it's a, it's a re really a fantastic idea. Uh, I'm very happy. Thank you very much for the opportunity. Okay. Um, I also am very glad to see uh, so many people doing well. I hope uh, you, you continue to do well, to stay safe and healthy. Uh, we in Brazil, unfortunately, we are mourning uh, the passing on Saturday, actually, from the COVID of a colleague uh, in, uh, in PDE. So it, was, it is very sad, and uh, I hope that you know, everybody uh, manages to stay healthy because this is uh, very sad and very terrible. A disease. Uh, okay, uh, <clears throat> so I'm going to talk today about analysis of incompressible flows with helical symmetry. And uh, let's see, I'd like to start by uh, acknowledging some uh, co collaborators. So this is based on some articles and papers with uh, Anne Bronzi, uh, Chuan Sin Ju, Milton Lopez Filho, and Dong Chuan Yu. So uh, let me start with the uh, uh, basic models that we deal with are, are Euler and Navier-Stokes. They're models for incompressible fluid flow, and they're given by the system of partial differential equations, which many of us know very well. So it's dTu plus u dot grad uh, on u is minus the gradient of pressure plus viscosity times the Laplacian of u. Uh, and then that, together with the incompressibility condition, divergence of u is zero. Uh, and then you add boundary conditions uh, depending on the fluid domain and initial conditions. Uh, the nonlinear term <coughs> u dot grad u simply means uh, the, uh, uh, the vector whose jth component is the sum of the differential operator ui ddxi applied to each of the components of u. p is a scalar pressure. And nu is a parameter, it's the kinematic viscosity, it's one over Reynolds number. And if it's positive, then these are the Navier Stokes equations. And if it's zero, these are the Euler equations. Okay, <clears throat> now, uh, some of the major themes from the point of view of analysis regarding this model are uh, the global existence of uh, smooth solutions for smooth initial data. It's a big open problem in 3D. I'll comment more in a minute. <clears throat> the uh, vanishing viscosity limit, uh, in other words, does never Stokes, do never Stokes solutions when viscosity tends to zero, do they converge to solutions of the Euler equations? Formally, uh, the taking viscosity equal to zero reduces never Stokes to Euler. And the question is, do the, does the limit of the solutions become a solution of Euler? <clears throat> some stability of special flows, shear flows, for instance. Uh, and this is, there was a, a beautiful talk by Nader Masmoudi some, some weeks ago about this. Uh, I'm not going to get into this. And also the um, modeling and how good a model are these uh, equations for irregular flows? Do they uh, capture transition to turbulence? Do they capture turbulence? Okay. So, in that respect, uh, the, uh, the main issue is um, how good are these models when you give singular initial data or irregular initial data? Okay, regarding global existence, uh, for Never Stokes in three dimensions, that's the million dollar problems, one of the million dollar problems from the Fields Institute, the Millennium Problems. Okay, um, for Euler in three dimensions, it's also open and it's not worth a million dollars. Okay, the existence of smooth solutions with smooth initial data. It's, a, it's still a very hard problem, but there's been considerable progress achieved uh, in particular by Tarek Elgindi and Inji Jong. Okay. <clears throat> uh, in this talk, we're concerned instead with solutions with symmetry. So let's make the problem a little bit easier and look at problems and, and impose some kind of symmetry to the problems, to the solutions. For instance, the easiest symmetry that one can impose is translational symmetry along an axis, and that gives rise to the two-dimensional flows. Uh, rotational symmetry along an axis or around an axis gives rise to the so-called axisymmetric flows. 
And if you put the two together, rotational and translational symmetry at the same time, this gives rise to the helical flows, which are the main subject of this talk. OK, um, <clears throat> let's look at results that we have for each of these kinds of flows, OK? Because these will be inspirations for what, what we'll do with respect to helical flows. So two-dimensional flows means uh, a vector the vector field velocity has two components, and they depend on two spatial variables, x1 and x2. OK, so if you have smooth initial data, then global existence of smooth solution has been known for about 100 years. So basically, since Liechtenstein uh, in the late 20s, uh, then there's uh, Volibler, and this, these are different uh, fluid domains that were treated and different uh, kinds of estimates um, <coughs> and, uh, and results, but they're all basically smooth is initial data, smooth solutions. Uh, McGrath and Cato in the uh, late 60s and early 70s also. Uh, for vanishing viscosity, we know that solutions of Never-Stokes with viscosity nu converge to solutions of Euler equations with uh, zero viscosity, of course. Um, if, as long as you have no boundary. Okay, so in the situation where you have no boundary, uh, this is okay. Uh, this was first proved by Swan in 1971. And then there's subsequent work, a lot of subsequent work by Kato, uh, Con Peter Constantin, and Jahong Wu, Nader Masmudi, and a billion other people who I'm not uh, quoting here, but who are very important to the history of this problem. So there's uh, a, a convergence rates. Uh, a lot is known in, on this problem different kinds of boundary conditions. Also, for instance, never boundary conditions also work if you do have a boundary. <clears throat> Let's look at irregular flows, because this is more uh, central to the main, main uh, thrust of this talk. So for irregular flows, the key quantity here is the vorticity, okay, which is for 2D, it's transported along the flow. Okay? So the vorticity is the two-dimensional curl of the velocity Okay, it's in, in general, it's the curl of the velocity, but in two dimensions, since it points always in the, along the same direction, we can identify it with a scalar, uh, which can be computed by taking the grad perp uh, and dotting it with u. It's kind of a div perp of u. So this grad perp is minus ddy comma ddx, or minus ddx2 comma ddx1. Okay, so this is, as I mentioned, it's transported by the velocity, and because it's transported by the velocity, so you have no vortex stretching, you find that you, you can prove existence globally in time of the solution of Euler in the following settings. If the initial vorticity is in LP, the scalar quantity, uh, omega naught is LP for any P larger than or equal to one. So there was an early proof of this for P greater than four thirds by Maida in 1986, then by, for P greater than one by De Pern and Maida in 1987, and by Delore and Vecchi Wu in the early 90s uh, for P equal one. So these are different kinds of proofs and we will explore each, okay? Uniqueness is only known in the case uh, P equals infinity and this was proved by Yudovich in 1963. Okay, and you also have a global existence if the initial velocity is L2 locally in, in the space and if the initial vorticity is a bounded measure with a distinguished sign. Okay, so this was a, a proof by, uh, d done by Delore in 1990. And then a shorter proof was written by uh, Steve Schachet and published in 1995. Okay, uh, <clears throat> this is going to be very important for the strategy. It's going to be very important in the rest of the talk. We also know global existence if the uh, initial vorticity is a, is a superposition of Dirac deltas uh, with positive ma mass at different points in the plane. However, uh, th this, this is known as the point vortex flow. It has infinite energy and there are many issues around this and it's not really a weak solution of the Euler equation. So when I say global existence for Euler, what I actually mean is global existence for the point vortex system. Okay. Uh, what about axisymmetric flows? So axisymmetric flows are given, are mostly understood in cylindrical coordinates. So you write them as a component in the radial direction plus a component in the azimuthal e theta direction. 
plus a component in the vertical direction EZ. And the best results that we have are for flows with no swirl. In other words, the U theta component vanishes. And we note that E theta is the unit vector which is tangent to circles with center on the symmetry axis. Okay, so if you have smooth initial data, then you have global existence of smooth solutions. And this was first proved by Yukovsky and Yudovich in 68, and a different proof was given by Maida in 1986. Okay, um, <clears throat> now the key quantity here is, the, is the, this particular component of vorticity omega over r. So it's omega, uh, uh, in the case of no swirl, the only component of the vorticity is this uh, e theta component, omega theta. And if you look at omega theta over r, this is a quantity which is transported okay, by the flow. Okay, so omega theta over r satisfies a transport equation. One fundamental uh, difficulty in proving global existence is the uh, vortex stretching, uh, which in, when you have a transport equation, basically you can deal with the vortex stretching. It gives you more estimates for uh, derivatives of the velocity. Okay, okay so uh, for the most world, most world flows, you have global existence if omega naught over r belongs to L6 fifths uh, intersection LP for P larger than three. This is an early result by Dan Ho Chi and Namo Kim from 97. Uh, then if uh, the uh, initial vorticity omega naught over r belongs to the Orlick space L log L to the alpha for alpha greater than a half. Okay, this is a, a year later by Che and Imanovov. And <clears throat> in L1 intersect LP, uh, via vanishing viscosity. Okay, so here, this, this was a proof done by uh, a paper by Chun Sun Ju, Jia Hong Wu, and Yang from 2014. And <clears throat> um, in, in this proof, they actually first to look at the uh, solution uh, for Niver Stokes, and then they take the vanishing viscosity limit. So we get both, both results in, in one city. However, uh, an intriguing result was obtained by Delore for uh, the case of the, the analog of vortex sheets and for axisymmetric flow. So if you have omega naught n, which is bounded in L1 and has a distinguished sign, and such that the uh, uh, impulse uh, or the first moment is also bounded in L1, then if you assume that the velocities converge in distributions, then either they converge strongly in L2 or the weak limit is not a weak solution of the Euler equations. It's an intriguing result for axisymmetric. And, and a question that we have for helical flows is, where do helical flows sit among these results? Are they closer to 2D? Are they closer to axisymmetric? Are they essentially 2D? Where, where do we sit with regards to helical flows in this dimensional scenario? Okay, so let's go to helical flows. So what is a helical flow? Okay, so here's a picture of a helically symmetric vector field, okay, or a helically symmetric velocity. And what we have is that at the same time, so here's my velocity, at the same time as uh, you rotate along, rotate and go up the helix, this vector will rotate along with the helix and move up. Okay, so it, it, it rotates, it's covariant with respect to the symmetry of the helix. The key parameter here is a translation, is this height, a translation up the z-axis after rotating one full turn. Okay, it's called a step or the pitch. Okay, um, <clears throat> the, a geometric description of helical flow is given in the, by the, in the following way. So we say that u is a helical vector field, if and only if u, u is covariant with respect to the symmetry given by S theta sigma prime. So M theta is the rotation around the symmetry axis. So you fix the uh, third component and it just rotate around the symmetry axis. And S theta is the rotation which fixes this and moves it up along with angle, uh, corresponding to angle theta. So if you rotate by theta, you move up by sigma prime theta. Okay. Uh, we, we also will need the definition of a helical function. So a scalar function f is called helical if it's invariant under s theta sigma prime. So you move up along the flow and the value of the function doesn't change along the helix. 
Okay, so a few remarks are in order. First of all, helical flows are always periodic with respect to the third component, and their period is two pi sigma prime, two, and, and that's the pitch, okay? Um, if the pitch is zero, then this reduces to axisymmetric flow, okay? This is pretty, pretty clear. And both Euler and Never strokes preserve helical symmetry. So this is a symmetry uh, as well as for the translational symmetry, the rotational symmetry, and translation plus rotation are all preserved by these incompressible fluid models. Okay, for never Stokes, we have a very nice well posedness result in the straight pipe. Okay, this is a, a bounded domain kind of situation or bounded in, in the uh, horizontal direction. Okay. <clears throat> so there exists a unique strong helical solution of never Stokes. Uh, which is no, well, it happens to be no slip at the boundary, okay, if the initial data is H10 periodic in the uh, X3 direction. And this is a result that was obtained by Alex Bohalov and Idris Titi and Leibovich back in 1990. <clears throat> and their proof relies on the following inequality, which is uh, Lajinskaya inequality, okay, uh, with the same exponents one half and one half here. So it's the same as the two dimensional. So this is one indication that this problem is closer to being two dimensional. Okay. This is for a general initial velocity in H1. Okay, the situation for Euler is quite a bit more complicated. First of all, we need to, to look at flows uh, for which uh, <clears throat> we're not going to get global existence always. We're going to get existence only for uh, something called no helical swirl flows. So in analogy with the uh, axisymmetric swirl component, we call this the, whole, the helical swirl, which is the component of velocity which is tangent to the helices. So you take a vector which is tangent to all the helices and you look at u dot c. Okay. No helical swirl means vanishing, it means uh, uh, u dot c is zero and it's preserved, it's a quantity which is preserved by the Euler equation. So if you start with, no, with zero helical swirl, you stay zero, zero helical swirl. Now for axisymmetric, if you start with zero swirl, you remain zero swirl for both Euler and Never-Stokes. We'll see that for Never-Stokes, uh, vanishing helical swirl is not preserved. But still, we're, we're talking about Euler here. Okay, so in the case of zero helical swirl, what makes it special is the fact that the vorticity, the curl of velocity, reduces to a vector which is parallel to the, uh, to the, to the helices. Okay, it's parallel to these uh, psi vectors. So it's given by this scalar quantity omega three times a constant two pi over sigma times the uh, vector C. Okay, omega three is a helical function and it's transported by the velocity. So this is what makes the helical Euler nice if you reduce to, if you restrict to heli no helical swirl. Okay. Under these conditions, well posedness was established for smooth initial data by Dutrefoy in 1999, so fairly recently. Uh, I, I'm getting old. Uh, existence and uniqueness of a weak solution was established if the vorticity uh, is L infinity, which basically means if omega three is L infinity, okay? Uh, actually, this should be X uh, omega three because psi is never L infinity. Uh, <clears throat> this would be, well, okay, so this is for pipe flow. Uh, this was done by Ettinger and TT 10 years afterwards, so in 2009. And their proof is a Udovich type of argument. Uh, there's no known global existence if the helical swirl is non-zero. Okay, and so this is much the same as for axisymmetric flow, where we don't have global existence if the uh, swirl component is, is uh, non-zero for Euler. Now, what we want to understand is uh, how far does this go once we start uh, reducing regularity? Okay, so there's been renewed interest in this problem because of the helical vortex filament, which, where the uh, uh, omega-3 is a helical solution, which is an approximate direct delta along a helix. Okay, so and this is a no helical swirl kind of uh, uh, solution. Okay, so there's been very recent work two weeks ago in archive by uh, Juan Davila, Manuel Del Pino, Monica Musso, and Jin Cheng Wei, uh, where they construct rigorously a, uh, um, <clears throat> such an approximate uh, direct delta along a helix, a very beautiful work. Okay? 
And uh, also there's been uh, some recent work by Oscar Velasco Fuentes uh, two years ago, where he, he does some careful asymptotics for the, uh, uh, for essentially the Biosavar law, for the, uh, uh, what the velocity looks like near the helix, right? in the case of direct delta or approximate direct delta. <clears throat> so what we're going to do is to seek a weak Euler solution, which is helical, no swirl, uh, where the third component of vorticity is an L1 or is as, cl as close as possible. Because the case of the vortex filament is going to be far too uh, irregular. This, this, these are sort of uh, like the point vortices for uh, 2D. Okay? But instead, we're going to, to uh, aim at a Delore type of result or as close as possible. And contrast with the 2D existence and axisymmetric existence results. So the recent results that we have are, first of all, global existence, uh, when the third component belongs to LP, compactly supported, uh, for P greater than four thirds. And this is a full space result. Okay, so this is periodic in the third direction, uh, and in the uh, X1, in the horizontal direction, you're in R2. Okay, so this was joint work with Anne Bronzy from five years ago. Okay, then uh, Chun Sin Ju, uh, Dong Jun Yu, and Jun Li, uh, they extended this to uh, omega 3 and LP for P larger than 1. Okay, I'm, I'm writing a compactly supported, but actually it's enough to, to ask for LP intersect L1. Okay, and <clears throat> now I'm going to also report on work in progress where we have a, a weak a global existence of a weak solution when the third component is in this Orlick space, L log L alpha for alpha greater than one. And again, this is a full space result, and this is work in progress with Anne Brodsky and Milton Lopes-Filho. Okay. Recall that omega-3 is transported, it's a, it's a helical function which is transported by a helical divergence-free vector field. Okay, so let's discuss strategies. All right, so the strategy is basically to pass to the limit in a weak formulation along weakly converging approximate solution sequences. So we can easily construct an approximate solution sequence by modifying initial data and solving the uh, helical Euler equations because we have global existence of smooth solutions for those. Okay, so the main difficulty in passing to the uh, weak, weak limit, as usual, is the nonlinear term, which in the velocity formulation is equal to uh, the, this nonlinear term, so it's un times d phi un, and phi is a test vector field, so it's C infinity and compactly supported. Okay. Or if we want to pass the limit in the vorticity formulation, then making use of the fact that omega-3 is transported, we need to pass the limit in un times omega-3. So we need to understand the, the product un times omega-3. Okay, so in order to... Um, proper contextualize things. Let's look at the strategies and results which were used for 2D because we're essentially mimicking those. So for P larger than four thirds, okay, might approved in 1986, the uh, uh, global existence for 2D Euler. And he did this by showing that uh, if a, the vorticity is LP by observing that if the vorticity is LP, then the velocity is W1P. It's one derivative better. And W1P, at least locally, is compactly embedded in LQ. For, and, and if you take P greater than four thirds, you can make Q bigger than the conjugate Lebesgue exponent to LP. So Q can be made bigger than P prime, okay? And that means that you get a weak strong pair in the vorticity formulation. So you're gonna get terms like U times omega in the vorticity formulation for 2D Euler and uh, U is going to be converging strongly, and omega is going to be converging weakly, so you can pass to the limit in the nonlinear term. How did the P greater than 1 case come about? Well, this was done by Dupert and Maida in 87. <clears throat> uh, again, they start from omega and LP, then velocity is in W1P, and W1P for P larger than 1 in R2 is compactly embedded in L2. Okay. That means that you can pass to the limit in the velocity formulation because the quadratic components of velocity, which appear in the velocity formulation of the Euler equations, will converge to the, the corresponding quadratic components of velocity. For P equals one and vortex sheets with a distinguished sign, a new approach was needed. Okay, and <clears throat> uh, this was done by Delore in 1991 and Vecchio in 1993. 
and rewritten uh, in a more uh, palatable form by Steve Schachett in 1995, uh, where he shows that a, a, a symmetrization argument in, the, uh, in a weak vorticity form makes the Biot-Savart singularity milder. So the Biot-Savart kernel is what links the velocity to the vorticity, okay? So <clears throat> let's continue our lessons from 2D flow. The Delors-Schachett symmetrization argument goes like this. If the divergence of u is zero and the curl of u is omega, and I'm talking about 2D now, then you get a Biot-Savart law. So you express velocity in terms of vorticity with a kernel k, which looks like this. So it's x minus y perp over two pi x minus y squared. So you have a one over x minus y singularity, okay? Then <clears throat> you rewrite your nonlinear term u dot grab phi omega, phi is again a test function. Uh, as you you uh, <clears throat> impose the Biot-Savart law, uh, substitute u for its Biot-Savart law, and symmetrizes. So you change the roles of x and y here <clears throat> um, and get half of one plus half of the other. That's the symmetrization, okay? And the fact that k is anti-symmetric gives you that the h phi is actually x minus y over x minus y squared, grad phi at x minus grad phi at y. But phi is a smooth test function. So this gives you an additional cancellation of x minus y, and therefore h phi turns out to be bounded globally and continuous off of that, that diagonal. So you really managed to cancel out the, completely the singularity. Now, for helical no swirl, uh, let's look at the results that we have and the different strategies that were used. So for p greater than four thirds, we use it as a Delors type of symmetrization. We first looked at what the Biot-Savart law is. Okay, so we express u, uh, the velocity u in terms of the vorticity, uh, omega three times psi, okay? We estimate this Biot-Savart kernel using a Bessel Fourier series to account for the uh, periodicity in the X3 direction. And we get a singularity which looks, which is still sort of a three dimensional singularity like one over X squared, okay? <clears throat> So we symmetrize the nonlinear term in the weak, for, the weak form. So here's the weak, for, the, the weak form that you have. This is my u term. This is my omega term. Okay, and I'm going to symmetrize this. Here's my test function. I'll symmetrize this uh, by exchanging the roles of x and y. Use also the, uh, the anti-symmetry. We have anti-symmetry of k here as well. Okay, so here's my auxiliary test function. And this man, and we, with this we managed to uh, also cancel partly the singularity. So the singularity goes from one over x squared to one over x. Okay. Now, <clears throat> therefore the critical regularity becomes like a 2D regularity for p greater than four thirds. And this is very natural because now the term h phi of uh, x3, xy, omega three of y, this term here looks kind of like the two-dimensional velocity because you have a singularity of one over x minus y. So basically this term here is gonna be compact in L cube for any Q larger than P prime. And we again have a weak strong pair type, type of argument. For P greater than one, uh, I will explain uh, in brief what uh, Chen Sen, uh, Jun Li and Dong Xuan did in, in 2017, how they extended this. They didn't use symmetrization. In a sense, we were a little too smart for our own good because symmetrization wasn't really needed. You could get a cheaper, a, a stronger result more cheaply. Uh, they used just elliptic regularity estimates and scaling to get the velocities compact in L2. Okay, so they, to do this, they have to use a different characterization of the uh, helical vector fields and the helical functions. So we look at these two, two um, <coughs> matrices, capital M and, and lowercase m. Okay, this capital M is simply the rotation around the uh, uh, x3 axis, around the symmetry axis. And we say that U is a helical vector field if and only if there is a two-dimensional vector field. So this um, um, W here actually has three components, but it depends only on two spatial variables, okay, so where U of x tilde x3 is this matrix times W of the uh, uh, rotated uh, uh, y1, y2, rotated um, horizontal variables, okay? 
This W is none other than the helical vector field on the plate, evaluated on the plane. So basically what you do is you look at the, the uh, vector field on the plane, and what this does is it, it uh, moves it up the helix. So what this, these matrices do is it moves this vector field on the plane up and around the helix. Okay. So what they show is that if omega-3 is LP, P larger than 1, and periodic, then the velocity is W1P of R3. Okay, so this is three-dimensional. Uh, this result in itself is not trivial because they have to go around the fact that the Biot-Savar law seems to have a nasty uh, local behavior in, in three dimensions. Okay, so they don't deal with this uh, local behavior at all. They simply use PDE methods. Uh, since the uh, flow is helical, it turns out that the, this uh, vector field W, which is now a two-dimensional vector field, this one is L, uh, W1P. Uh, <clears throat> therefore, it's compact in L2 in two dimensions. And <clears throat> then you use the compactness of W to get compactness of U in L2 uh, in the three, three space dimensions. So this is an analog of the Dipernamida 1987 result for 2D. Okay, so we still are pretty far from uh, the Delore result. So let's try to get closer to L1. So let's look at Orlick spaces, and this is the ongoing work with M. Brodsey and Miltilope Philho. Okay. So we looked at a scalar, helical scalar function uh, with uh, no, no helical swirl. And it's, it, assuming that it's, it, it will be a solution to the no swirl uh, vorticity equation, if and only if, when you look at it on the plane, it's a smooth solution of this other uh, equation, which happens only on the plane. So dt omega plus a divergence free with respect to the y variables vector field, doc rad omega is zero. Okay. Now the relation between omega and uh, psi is not, psi is not your standard string function. So psi omega is not the curl of uh, the grad perp of psi. Uh, instead, Omega is related to psi through a linear operator, uh, linear elliptic operator with variable coefficients. Okay, so here it is. Okay. Uh, moreover, you can recover omega three from capital omega by undoing this uh, this uh, uh, thing using the fact that omega three is a helical function. Okay. So u now is a helical flow with a vorticity omega three. If, if in that case, if you restrict to the plane and call this V, then you can recover U from V and V from U. Okay. The fact that the third component is given by this comes from the uh, no swirl uh, result. Okay, so you can recover completely U from V. So it's enough to study V. In addition, you can express uh, grad perp of psi, the, uh, the, the divergence free vector field which transports capital omega in terms of V through this matrix uh, H, the matrix H here, this matrix. Okay. Now, from the Biot-Savar law for U in terms of omega, you then restrict to x3 equals zero you write omega-3 in terms of capital omega, and you get a, a, a formula, a uh, Biot-Savar law type of result for V in terms of capital omega. So you can rewrite your nonlinear term, grad perp of psi times grad omega, times omega, I'm sorry, um, <clears throat> using this uh, Biot-Savar, this new Biot-Savar uh, law, okay? Uh, so you, so you, you happen to have H of Y times P of Y eta, where P is this new bios of our kernel. Now it turns out that H times P is easier to estimate than what we had before. And plus now everything really is legitimately 2D. So you again symmetrize, and then you can show uh, that you get uh, uh, in, even more cancellation. So you actually have uh, H phi is bounded by not, not a constant, but a log plus of one over y minus eta. So now the nature of the singularity is, the, the, is logarithmic. Okay. So this result simply gives you, if you assume that the initial uh, omega naught is L log L alpha intersect L1, which means this, okay? And that's the same as placing an assumption on omega three because of the, uh, the way you translate things from, from uh, the y plane 
to the uh, uh, x1, x2, x3 uh, space. <clears throat> this is transported by the divergence free vector field. So because the L log L alpha is rearrangement invariant, you remain in L log L alpha. And <clears throat> the, this uh, decay, this, this behavior of the, the singularity for H phi uh, is uh, enough to be able to pass to the limit in this nonlinear term when you have L log L alpha for capital omega. Basically because uh, the, the uh, log plus of one over y in small balls or, or close to the singularity will go to zero if alpha is greater than one. So basically you do this by duality. You put one of these omegas in L1, you put the other in L log L alpha, you put the singularity uh, in the uh, dual space L exponent alpha, L x alpha, uh, and then you show that close to the singularity, you still vanish as long as alpha is greater than one. Now, L log L alpha, uh, locally at least, is, is something that is between L1 and LP. So you actually manage to extend to, use, to a great deal of trouble. After a great deal of trouble, you manage to extend uh, your uh, LP, P larger than one result to this Orlick space, okay, even for alpha greater than one. So this is a small improvement at great cost over Ju, Li, and Yu. The symmetrization cancels out the singularity and makes it milder. The problem seems to be two-dimensional, but we still have no L1 or bounded measure intersect H minus one result yet. So in other words, this existence result is still quite unsatisfactory. Okay. Um, it, now let me spend some brief moments discussing the issue of vanishing viscosity for helical flows. So recall the uh, helical swirl. And uh, if, if you have a helical swirl, which is non-trivial, then the vorticity is given, the full vorticity will be given by omega-3 times psi plus d, d eta dy minus d eta dx comma zero. So you can express it in terms of the helical swirl eta. Okay. In particular, of course, if eta is zero, then we're reduced to what we already had. Okay. <clears throat> the uh, uh, vorticity equation for helical vector fields can be written now as the transport term, the omega dt, plus the scalar quantity, here's my stretching, omega 3 u2 minus u10, plus a, a terms involving dx eta. And if you have never Stokes, you have new Laplacian of omega on the other side, on your right hand side. <clears throat> of course, if eta is zero, this is not here, the, the eta terms are not here. And if the uh, viscosity is zero, then you don't have you have zero on your right-hand side, you don't have the Laplacian term, so the third component is simply transported by omega, by you. <clears throat> the problem is that if you look at the equation for the helical swirl, it's, uh, it being zero initially does not imply that it's zero forever, for, for never Stokes. Okay, so if nu is positive, vanishing helical swirl is not preserved, and in this sense, this is a very different situation from what you had for axisymmetric flow. Okay, you have an amplification term here if viscosity is positive, positive given by omega-3. <clears throat> the equation for omega-3 couples to the equation for eta. So you have the, uh, this uh, uh, vortex stretching term over here. Okay. Okay. <clears throat> now, and here I'm reporting on joint work with Trent and Ju, Milton Lopes-Filho and Dong Jun Yu. Okay. We have, uh, we'll introduce a helical uh, decomposition of a helical divergence free vector, uh, which is this, w is eta psi over psi squared, v is u minus w, v and w are both helical and divergence free, uh, v is the, the no swirl component, okay. and they're orthogonal. Okay. Uh, since v is uh, no swirl, then its curl is given by the third component uh, omega, of, uh, of uh, omega-3 of the curl times psi. Okay. If u is helical over the three, then this is the helical decomposition. We call this a helical decomposition. Take an initial velocity, which is h1 periodic. Look at an initial helical swirl, which is not going to be zero. There's no point in making it zero. Okay. Suppose you convert strongly to the uh, Euler, to an Euler uh, uh, initial flow u naught e, <clears throat> which is no swirl, okay? Look at the uh, Never-Stokes solutions. 
write the helical decomposition. And then we note that we can write explicitly the equations for, uh, so V is the no swirl component of U nu. Okay, so we write an equation for V and we write an equation for omega, for omega three. Okay, using these two equations, we have the following estimates for U nu. U not nu bounded in L2. In fact, we're going to even ask for it bounded in H1. U not L2 bounded by constant times viscosity. Then uh, the uh, L infinity L2 norm of U nu is bounded. That's just a standard energy estimate for never Stokes. Uh, the vorticity omega nu is given by this object here with omega three uniformly bounded. This is the key estimate. Using the equation for omega three, uh, you can bound uh, omega three in L infinity in time into L two independent of nu. <clears throat> Eta nu is bounded in H one independent of nu. Okay, and moreover, I, I didn't write this, but you can show that this this uh, estimate here is preserved. So Eta nu, in fact, in L two uh, is always less than or equal to uh, constant times nu. It's always order of nu. Okay, with this we can prove the following theorem. <clears throat> uh, if U not nu converges to U not strongly in H1, and U not is helical with no helical swirl, and the helical swirl, swirl for never Stokes vanishes like nu, like viscosity, then uh, passing some sequences as needed, the vanishing viscosity limit holds in the sense that U nu will converge to U, to the, uh, to U in L2 in time L2. Uh, the uh, limit will be continuous in time into L2, L infinity in time into H1, and it's a weak solution of the Euler equations with helical symmetry. So this is the best that we could do for the vanishing viscosity limit, uh, given that you have, no, you have this uh, no helical swirl, uh, non-preservation by uh, Never Stokes. Okay, I'd like to close with that and also wish our friends from France, I don't know if there's anyone online, uh, joyeux 14 juillet. Thank you.